Welcome tonight, <clears throat> President Ortiz. Would you like to lead us in the flag salute? Yes. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Councilmember Ars? Here. And Councilmember Lucchese? Here. Councilmember Keisler. Here. Councilmember Deutsch. Here. And Mayor Bryan. Present. Um, tonight we have special guests, uh, the folks from the Cisco Economic Development um, and or um, the TVID Discover Cisco group are going to be giving a presentation. You guys can come to the podium. Uh, make sure you're near the microphone uh, when speaking to the folks on Zoom. <laughs> We've seen a lot of you guys in the last two years. It's wonderful <laughs> yes. to see everyone in person again. Okay, good. Um, how's the mic? Okay. Sorry about the feedback. Congratulations on motherhood. Thank you. I brought a plus one. You'll see today. <laughs> so um, we want to thank Guns America because during uh, COVID and following COVID, you guys were very agile in um, having us present through Zoom. So thank you for that. It's great to be here though now in person um, to provide our quarterly update. My name is Corey Hayden and I'm a program manager at the Cisco EDC. I think I've worked there four years now. And um, you'll also hear from my colleagues today as well, Quentin Quentin Gaddy and um, Heather Dots. So um, you'll hear most unique information from my colleagues and just uh, a little bit of general anecdotal information from me. Um, so uh, first of all, um, uh, we, we don't necessarily do this at every council, but I do want to invite this council in particular for your location um, and your hospitality to us to our economic summit. It's every fall. Um, our annual economic summit is held in McLeod, which is, I think, a sister city um, in terms of location for you and not a, fall, not a far travel. And it'll be on Monday, November 7th from 3 to 5. And so it is almost a showcase of our work um, in terms of it's hosted by our board and um, several members of our board are businesses in Dunsmere, that being Louie Dewey of Cave Springs Resorts and Kit Marshall of Castle Rock Water. So they are part of the hosting committee of the programming of this <coughs> evening. Um, the evening will feature um, business vignettes and stories over the past year. Um, uh, greetings from state officials who who want to share their um, goodwill and good nature for Siskiyou County's businesses and industries and our work um, and a keynote speaker and great food. So um, I will make sure that we follow up with an email invitation on that evening, but we would love to see you there on Monday, November 7th. Oh, excuse me, where? Axe and Rose in the cloud. So just, just a few miles down the road. Um, so we look forward to hosting that evening. Um, in addition, um, some things that I can share is we are always gracious for your MOU investment in our work. Um, cities and the county um, from across Siskiyou um, share a united MOU for economic development services. And so part of our reporting tonight and quarterly is to let you know how, um, how your investment is going. Um, so some ways that you see that investment at work is part of the Small Business Development Center, which you'll hear from Quinton, um, which is a program that mitigates unemployment across the county in every region and is very much at work here in Densmere, which you'll hear from Quinton. Um, often you'll hear about our Brownfields program. And so that is our ability um, to provide funding for any real or perceived contamination on sites that you care about getting back into industry or business. And so we have funding available to do phase one assessments on sites to learn more. Um, if you would like to see a property um, that is not currently in use, uh, return to use. So I always like to mention the Brownfields program. Um, we have very been very, very interested in our food economy lately. Um, so that is everything from items um, procured or bottled here, like Castle Rock Water is a great example, to um, produce at our farmer's markets, chocolate, beer, wine, uh, beef. And so we have introduced Siskiyou Farm Co. into the marketplace. And so you can 
visit siskiyoufarmco.com online to see what it's all about. Um, but it is like shopping for local food products the same way you might shop on Etsy or Amazon. So you have the opportunity to browse several producers um, and add items to your cart with one easy checkout. And the way that you get your items is you can pick them up in a customized packaged box with your flowers and your wine and your steaks and your pyroelastic chocolates, um, which come from weed, <laughs> um, all together on Wednesdays. And the closest site to you right now is Mount Shasta. So I hope that's good news. Um, and we continue to be adding sites as the program grows. So right now we have 80 beta testers testing the site, experiencing it, um, checking out and picking up and then giving us feedback. So we certainly invite council and any community members in Dunsmere um, to engage with siskiyoufarmco.com. We think it's um, really fun and great for the food brands of Siskiyou County. We're very proud. When you put it all together and you see what's available here, um, Northbound Coffee is another example of a product that's there. We hear it's the best price that you can find uh, Northbound Coffee at. So, um, so those were the two um, things I wanted to mention was um, the, that the MOU investment is one reason why we report here. We're very, very gracious. Um, we're also looking forward to working with your new city manager. Hello, Dustin. I'm Corey. Hello. It's nice to meet you in person. Nice to meet you. Thank you for your e email correspondence this week. Yes, I appreciated no it. Um, we are um, always uh, grant seeking, grant writing on behalf of Siskiyou County. We do um, try to put forth competitive applications for state and federal funding so that um, those funders have Siskiyou County priorities at front of mind. Um, so we are able to submit competitive and compelling applications on behalf of our region that we are very, very proud of. If you ever have any questions about that, we can certainly answer them. Um, so with my invitation to several opportunities extended, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to my colleague, Quentin Gaddy, who specializes in the Small Business Development uh, Center and the Micro Assistance uh, Grant Program. Quentin. Thank you, Corey. Thanks for putting me in touch with Jason. You're welcome. Uh, am I close enough? Can you pick me up? Okay, awesome. So I'll start with the um, <clears throat> Small Business Development Center and I'll sort of uh, do a refresher of what it is and what we do there. So as many of you are aware, I, I took over the Small Business Development Center in January this year. I've been running it into the ground ever since, but uh, <laughs> we, we, we do a lot of really engaging work in the community with the, with the SBDC. And so we do everything from helping businesses just get started from the get-go. So everything from getting their licenses, their permits, um, incorporating if they choose to do so at the state level and navigating all of that. For existing businesses, we help them <clears throat> develop and augment their marketing plans, their sales plans. We provide them location-based data for their, for their physical brick and mortar shops that can show them foot traffic as it fluctuates throughout the year, throughout the day even. Um, so we provide all these different services to small businesses throughout the county. And um, oftentimes we're known as the best kept secret and we're, we're, we're trying to change that prerogative. We want folks to know who the Small Business Development Center is, how small businesses can get help, what help looks like, what kind of resources. So uh, in this last year, we helped Siskiyou County businesses close close to $4 million in capital financing. Uh, the exact number is 3.7 million. Um, in the city of Dunsmere, we work with 32 clients, 16 actively within the last year. Of the capital raised last year, 360,000 came from the city of Dunsmere. And we also look at, at jobs, we look at increases in sales, we look at other things too, like you know, helping businesses just get set up on payroll. You know, especially there's a lot of businesses who operate under the table and they want to get legit, they want to get everything on their taxes, they just don't have the skills needed, and, and we provide that assistance. Um, we always take referrals. We don't uh, charge for any of our services. We're funded by the USSBA in the state of California. And so uh, we're able to take referrals from, from council members at, at any time. So if you know any businesses who need help and they don't know about us, point them our way. Secrets out. Secrets out, that's, that's the goal. <clears throat> What's your relationship with Jedi? We, we have a, a very collaborative, um, we try to complement and augment each other's services. If I was to sort of summarize it, JEDI can be a little more hands-on for a lot of the nascent stage clients, the ones who, who, who need just as much coaching and reassurance as they do uh, financial assistance. Oftentimes, a lot, of, a lot of clients 
quote unquote graduate from Jedi and then they come over to me. I'll give you an example. Um, I started working with a Jedi client about three months ago who'd been working with them on developing her business plan, her marketing plan. And um, she then went over to us. We helped her develop three year pro formas for her financials. And she closed an SBA 504 loan for commercial property for 780,000 just last week on the 28th actually is, is when, the, when the loan closed. And so that can show you how one client can come from Jedi and then come up to us. And so when it, when it gets to talking with a bank, um, either Nina or Trish at Jedi will usually loop me in with their client and then refer them over to the SBD. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the CDBG CV1 program. So this is the micro enterprise program on behalf of the entire county that Dunsmere has been administering. And so we started with a budget of $670,000 we have spent 400,000 so far of that. So that leaves us about $270,000. And the, the, this contract runs through June of next year. And so we are on track to, to draw this fund down all the way. Um, so far we've assisted and funded, fully funded 20 micro enterprises with these funds. Um, we have five in the queue who are gonna go out this next month. Uh, Manya will be issuing, issuing the checks in a few weeks. Uh, we have four that are sort of in a standby phase where either their documents are incomplete or they haven't been registered on sam.gov um, so but they're eligible to be funded and then there have been five that have been declined for ineligibility either because um, they didn't meet the program guidelines or they were um, they were not income qualified um, so they, they they made too much money uh, to participate in the program um, of all those businesses, five have been in the city of Dunsmere and have received $75,000 in grant funds. There's one in queue and one sort of in standby where I haven't received all the documents from them. And so that's where we stand with that program. Once we draw down all the funds with those, we're going to transition to the CDBG Dunsmere microenterprise grant. We have three prospective clients in that program lined up so far. Um, two of which were participants of the CDBG CV1 for, for COVID impact, but we're going to be looking at using this program for some um, significant investments, particularly in kitchen infrastructure, things like uh, freezers, um, grills, uh, cooking equipment, stuff like that. And so for this program, we are putting together a loan advisory committee to approve all of those uh, grant submissions and the committee is going to be apprised of Dustin and Blake from the city, myself and, and two members of the public. Um, I believe the proposed members we have right now are Len Foreman and Mark Rowley. And that program's uh, slated to run through June 2024. Upon 50% expenditure of the program, we can apply to the state for, for more money to keep it a revolving program. And I think it's in, in the hopes of a lot of people to, to direct some of that money, particularly towards um, revitalizing downtown and getting more brick and mortar shops in, in a lot of those vacant buildings. So could you um, reiterate the overall amount in our program? Yeah, that's gonna be a quarter million okay. in total, uh, of which about 200 of that is, is gonna be sequestered straight for businesses. I do have one question. I do wanna raise this. Um, so is Mark Raleigh still involved with the city? I thought he kind of pulled back. That's at least in the chamber. Pregnant, uh, right now oh, you just mentioned them yeah so i i don't think we have any any contra or like any anything set up yet this is this is just what has has been proposed okay. what i'm when i'm sort of continuing off but we'll we'll formalize everything last but not least i really want to give a big shout out to the city of dunsmere staff particularly blake manya and wendy they've just been phenomenal to work with they're super quick at getting back to me with anything their documents are always perfect i'm more likely to make a mistake than them and they catch me on my mistakes and they keep me they keep me straight. So for that, um, I'm very thankful for them. Um, last but not least, some other updates is there's been some rumblings and some inklings at the state about reforms for fire insurance. And so this is something we're, we're following very, very closely. This is something that affects Dunsmere businesses perhaps more than anything else right now. There are so many businesses that I hear from that either get denied outright from fire insurance or their rates are through the roof. And they're like, do we just skip a year and maybe get it next year and, and take our chances? Those are, those are serious considerations that business owners are taking right now. And so we're looking at getting those stories. If you have any up to the state, we send them to the governor's office of business and economic development, and we send them to our legislators. So uh, uh, to both of the dollies. And so if you know of any businesses who have struggled with fire insurance, please let us know. Um, with that, thank you. If there are any other questions.
If not, I'm going to hand it off to Heather to talk about. I have uh, a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Quentin, for your work over the last couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. With the the 250,000 in our own uh, micro enterprise program, mm -hmm. are the restrictions the same as the COVID micro enterprise? No, they're actually the open. They're opened up quite a bit, so there doesn't have to be any kind of COVID nexus, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. So we can apply it to startups as well. Um, the underwriting standards are going to be looked at a little differently with that program. So the COVID program, we're treating straight as a recovery. The Dunsmere program, we have that option if there is a COVID nexus, mm -hmm. but we would, we would underwrite and look at projects much more like a lender would look at them. So what we want to see, for example, is, is, is folks will hear there's grants available and they're like, oh, great, I've got a business idea. It's like, well, we want to make sure you have skin in the game. We want to see this as a matching fund or as last dollars in or as a way to make market improvements. So for example, with restaurants, you know, their margins are super, super tight. And with the cost of goods and everything going up right now, uh, a really strong use of grant funds is replacing the, the, the equipment that constantly breaks that you have to pay a repairman over and over again, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, things that can reduce the operating costs of a business is how we're looking at structuring these grants. Yeah, and then um, when it comes to the micro part of the micro enterprise, is it the same five employees or less? Yeah, yeah, that okay. part it, that part is the same and the income qualification process is also But it could be used for a startup, which is good to spread the word out. Yes, it could be, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you said 200,000 we used for, um, directly for business loans or grants. Mm -hmm. uh, is that 50,000 tied to the loan um, you were working with our prior city manager on? regarding uh, economic development? No, um, so, so we also have another CDBG activity in the queue. Mm -hmm. So the city of Dunsmere last summer applied through the 2021 NOFA for a quarter million economic development planning activity to revitalize downtown. We've got our fourth CDBG representative in the past year assigned to us. Um, he just reached out to Blake and I last week to, to start set up meetings. And I checked in with him and I was like, hey, where's this, where's this at in the process? And they say, oh, it's in review. Okay. So um, it's still up at HCD, but we are, we are waiting for that. And then when it, when it comes to it, I believe the plan was to have the city go out and bid for um, contractors on that one. All right, thank you so much for that update. Yeah, you bet. I really appreciate all the work. Any additional questions? Thank you. All right, Heather's going to talk about tourism now. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. I'm Heather Dawes. I'm program director for Discover Cisco. Um, I thought I would just give kind of a brief overview background of our program. Um, we've been around since 2015 when Cisco County Lodging Properties just the first ever tourism improvement district in Cisco County. Um, we bring together eight uh, jurisdictions as well as county territory um, with the goal of um, raising sustainable funds to market the region as a for outdoor recreation. Um, we're run by a six member management committee. Uh, Louie Dewey from Cape Springs is on our committee. Um, Mark Lilly from Railroad Park. Um, we have a really great management committee. Um, Jeff Lee committee. Um, we meet quarterly to talk about our marketing activities and our program is funded by a 2% assessment on room space. Um, we use these funds to deploy a pretty robust marketing campaign. We do um, a lot of print ads. We've done billboards recently. We wrapped up a camp campaign in Sacramento um, in June that got over 3 million impressions. And um, we heard from the billboard uh, company that it was one of their most successful campaigns to date. So that was pretty cool to hear. Um, we also do, we have ads right now in the Medford and Reading airports. Um, we have brochures and welcome centers from Washington down through Southern California. We do a lot of digital stuff as well. We have a Google ads campaign that's running all the time. Um, we've done video ads on streaming services like Hulu and Netflix. Um, we're continuously pitching CISU related story ideas to journalists, um, kind of just try to hit everything we can. Um, and in addition to marketing, we've developed a number of initiatives to benefit our stakeholders, which are lodging properties. Um, and one of these is our event marketing program. So this fiscal year, we've allocated $60,000 to supporting community events. We recently funded the Steampunk Festival um, here, and we've been working pretty closely with Cheryl at the Chamber to help um, kind of amplify the Chamber's marketing efforts. And we hope that the city will apply for future events as well. Um, 
And then we produce a video series called Siskiyou Snapshots. We've done a few featuring um, fishing here and we have more on the horizon. So look, look for those coming up. Um, we have a social media campaign. Um, we do paid social and we bring influencers here who have large followings. We actually have one coming into town tomorrow and she's gonna do fly fishing on the upper sack. So she's gonna be um, kind of in and around Desmere and sharing that with her followers, which will be really fun to see. Um, and then kind of getting into some of the metrics, um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, the pandemic brought a lot of people actually into our county. Um, a lot of our lodging property owners have reported that 2021 was actually their best year on record. Um, and while we would have loved to keep that trajectory going, uh, you know, we know it, it had to cap out at some point. And so we see it coming down a little bit now, I think, um, you know, that can be attributed to a few things, gas prices definitely being one of them, right? Like a lot of everyone pretty much drives to us. Um, and then people just taking those bigger trips that they've put off, you know, because of the pandemic now that air travels opened up quite a bit more and all of that. Um, but we're by no means in a bad spot. Um, when we first entered the marketplace, uh, generated around $350,000 of revenue. And when we wrapped up last fiscal year, we had brought in um, almost 900,000. Um, so we're growing, people are staying here. It's really encouraging to see. And we're really just focusing right now a lot of, on a lot of that um, regional travel because I think people aren't driving quite as far for the gas, you know, because of gas prices. So um, we're doing a lot of marketing in Southern Oregon, Reading, trying to co-market with destinations there as well, try to get people who maybe have a, a trip planned in Reading to come up here for a day or two and attack it onto their trip. So that's kind of our strategy. Questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, Heather, I'm excited about the fact that you've got a little bit of work going into uh, promoting events mm -hmm. and I'm liaison with the chamber. Great. And one of the things that we've talked about here is taking a, a clear view and saying, how do we market ourselves in total and who does what and how does that fit in? Is that something that we could work out where we have a meeting where you guys in the chamber sit down and, and come up with a, um, a vision of how we market and then figure out who has the different responsibilities? Yes. Yeah, I would love that. And so we actually have a fund separate from our fund that we're using to work with um, chambers or and or cities. Um, you know, obviously we market Siskiyou as a whole, but we can be a lot stronger if each individual community also has a really strong marketing effort. So we, yeah, we're definitely here to help if you wind up needing something like a new website or maybe like going through a brand identity process, a new logo, things like that. That's something that we can help with as well as just helping with your overall marketing strategy. Yeah, I, I think the key here is, is that um, we need to understand um, where is the most effective use to get people in yeah. and what is it that the chamber does and how, how do other chambers in the county react with you? And is there an interplay there also? Yeah, it kind of varies um, from community to community. We are constantly um, trying to get chambers to meet with us. Um, we like, you know, like Clint mentioned, right, with Jedi and the SBDC, we don't want to duplicate efforts that chambers are making. We want to work with them. And, you know, we, we have a big following. So whenever we can share what you're doing with our audience, it just amplifies your, your efforts. Um, the other thing I was going to mention, and this reminded me, was we have, um, we purchased some really cool business analytics software where we could actually drill into a specific business, a specific address. <laughs> and, um, you know, whereas we can look, before we could look at the county as a whole, now we can see specifically this lodging property, this retail space, this restaurant, who's coming here, what are the demographics of the people coming there, where are they coming from, how much are they spending, and I think that's been really helpful for a lot of our, our chambers and stakeholders as well. So we're Thank happy you. to do that. Yeah. Well, if we stick with the chamber <laughs> and we understand the years of COVID were particularly tough on local economies, yeah. causing our chamber to effectively shut down, now they're rebuilding. It's somewhat counterintuitive to me that as we try to rebuild our local economy, we're sending so many dollars to Wairika. So oh, I didn't know that you were part of Steampunk. What, what was the ask from the chamber and 
what did you do? Um, yeah, so we, they asked for the full award amount, which was $3,000, which we gave to them. And, um, you know, the district funds have to be spent on marketing. They can't be spent on things like hard costs, like say even insurance or things like that. So um, we talked to Cheryl about running some paid social ads. You can use it to hire talent. So like live music, um, that type of stuff. So really, yeah, marketing that event um, and get, helping get the word out. As, as we try to get back on our feet with our mostly summer events, mm -hmm. railroad days, uh, Brewfest, mm -hmm. perhaps steampunk, the Dunsmuir Chamber of Commerce is asking the city for general fund dollars, significant general fund dollars to promote Dunsmuir. So I do sort of add on to the question I, and I'm near my end of service, but when Louis Dewey got up and said, yes, this is a good thing, let's do that. I respected it and voted yes. But I think there ought to be some sort of assurance from <laughs> the sum of the three units. I think the small business program sounds very strong. I'm excited about that. But the promotional part, I don't know that the taxpayers are really getting the best bang for their buck as we read. Yeah, well, I will note that it's not funded. This is separate from TOT. So this is funded by the tourists who are staying in the hotels, but I do see, but still, yeah. And, and with the short-term rentals, um, it's a very rapidly evolving landscape. Mm -hmm. And I hope the communication in the future gets a lot better so that everybody's assured uh, that we actually get a return, mm -hmm. whether it's time or general fund or wherever the revenues come from. Thank you, Councilor. Any additional questions? Uh, I have, I guess, one. You yeah. mentioned a, a great many um, avenues where you guys um, try out promotional activities for mm -hmm. Siskiyou County. Um, and I realize we're, we're our self experience time of transition away from print being a mainstay and digital hasn't really fully replaced it yet. Um, do you have any metrics you could share with us on like exactly where the money is being spent and what the effects are? Because we'd love to see if you've tried all these at scale, mm -hmm. um, what the results are, or could you at least speak to what, what hasn't worked? Yeah, for sure. And I hesitate to say hasn't worked. Um, I would say harder to track, right? Like the print. Um, you know, we've done a lot of brochures. We've had, you know, our lodging properties really wants rack cards, right? And I, I think they're great. Um, again, like at print ads in like, um, we did one in out, Outside Magazine. Um, you know, we've done a lot of newspaper ads and they're great and they're beautiful, but that's been really hard to track for us. Like we know how many they printed, but we don't know how many eyeballs are actually on them. Um, so to me, our Google ads campaign is huge. Um, we get, depending on how much we spend around, I don't know, 200,000 to 400,000 impressions per month. And we track our conversions on that too. So we can see who clicks our ads and then who clicks on the book now button on our site, which we count as a conversion because we don't actually make the sale on our site. But our conversion rate on that is around 30%, which is hmm. huge. Typical is like around six or seven, like that's considered really good. Yeah. Um, and I can share with you like how much we spend and like the cost per click yeah, and all of that. What is the yearly spent on Google Ads? <laughs> yearly spend around 40 to 50,000. Okay. So an example would be if someone goes into the computer, types in Dunsmuir, California, mm -hmm. is that one of the words you guys pay? For? Yeah, we so do that. So it doesn't that. go to Dunsmuir, it would go to Discover Siskiyou. Or Dunsmuir Hotels, lodging in, yeah, Northern California. Yeah, yeah. we're paying to be that top spot. That brings up, you know, following up on what we were talking about before, if we had a session and sat down and looked at how are we going to do events, how are we going to do the other different things, and then where is the most effective? Mm -hmm. You know, that way, if we're spending money from the chamber, that's not being very useful in bringing people in a different strategy. So I think the way to look at it is, is um, starting off with, like the mayor said, what are the most effective ways? Yeah. And then how do we work together as chamber and discover Siskiyou to get the most out of those effective uh, 
Yeah, absolutely. Google ads and social media is the other one. Facebook, particularly for this community, a lot of people here are on Facebook and you're able to really drill down into your target audience and it's relatively inexpensive as well. It's a lot more inexpensive than Google ads. So right. um, yeah. And, I have one final question, Councilman Carson. No. Uh -huh. One final question. I know originally you had a five-year term and you're successful mm -hmm. in re-upping it. Is it five years, five years, five years? No, or? we actually asked for a 10-year term and, and that received. was granted in 2019. So cool. we're in year eight right now. Cool. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you all. I, Thank I, you. I would like oh. to say one thing that I am really glad and excited is the siskyfarmco.com. This is the way everybody gets a piece of our own pie. I commend you on that. Great. Thank you. Dave, we appreciate that. Thank you. Salt and savers on it. Yeah, that's it. I should have mentioned that. Okay. I have two bottles. Salt and savers sauce. Shout out to my friend. Our doctor tried to prescribe the salad. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, serious. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to open up uh, the podium for public comment, uh, general public comment this evening. Um, if you're with us on Zoom, please hit the raise your hand button and we'll get you to your public comment. You'll be allotted three minutes time. Um, I will give you a warning 30 seconds in. This is for any items not on the agenda concerning the city business um, or items that are on the consent agenda, which is the check registry for the last two weeks and uh, update authorized signers on LEAF, local agency investment fund, and recommend transfer of decommissioned fire hydrants and surplus property and self <laughs> on that agenda or generally city business that's not otherwise on the agenda, uh, please come to the podium. Hello, I'm Allison, uh, 5334 River Avenue. This is my friend Laurel. And uh, thank you for everything you guys do. I, I really appreciate it. And Wendy, thank you for all your service. Uh, I'm very appreciative for what you all do for the town. Um, I know uh, a few council meetings ago, I believe over three months ago, we talked about a commitment uh, to a regular check-in with the Rec and Parks District. I'd like some follow-up on that. that I continue uh, to express deep concern uh, for, for some of the same things that I mentioned uh, at previous meetings. Uh, the concern is about lack of communication um, from both the administration with the Rec and Park and the board there. I'm looking for, um, for more sustainability. Um, I believe last time we spoke, we were all really excited about um, the softball tournament. I thought it was great. I, um, part of the grant money I raised for them was used for it, maybe about a third of it or so. I saw it as an investment opportunity um, for, for the town with our beautiful asset of the baseball field and all the community work Dave and everyone else put into it. I continue to ask them now what? that we have that, what can we do for our children with the baseball field? What can we do to use it as an asset um, to, to get a return on that investment? Um, it's looking real good. So I'm, I'm not really getting too many answers. I'm also looking for sustainability with pool seasons. Um, you know, so, so we know we're gonna have a nice long pool season like we did last year, every year. Um, I've directed them to various grant opportunities. I've asked them to commit to them no action, uh, no response. It's actually embarrassing I have to come up here to, to say this instead of continue to go there, but it seems that this is the only avenue. My words have fallen on deaf ears. Um, I've led the horse to water, so to speak, uh, with grant opportunities for children, uh, which is my biggest concern uh, in the town here. And uh, I really would like to use our wonderful assets such as the pool and the baseball field to, to help promote you know, free, free recreational opportunities for, for folks in the town and to, to give some kids uh, like Laurel here, you know, some direction and things to do. Um, so I ask you guys to please continue to pursue uh, closer communication and relationship with Rec and Park. Um, I believe you had said quarterly meetings with them last time or something, I would have to check the notes. Um, and I ask uh, that you stop blindly throwing money at an organization that's lacking direction. Do you want to talk now, Laurel? No. You don't want to say anything? <laughs> no. Say, say, I'm, say I'm Laurel. You could do it. See all these other women that came up here and did it. My name is Laurel. My name is Laurel. I like to play outside and I 
I heard you are remodeling the park. I would like some monkey bars, please. Thank you, monkey bars. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Thank you Alex. Good job. Good job, Laura. Thank you, guys. Good Thank job. You. I thought we did it. Now we sit. Uh, if anyone else would like to make a public comment, please come to the podium. Or if you're on Zoom, uh, raise your hand. I uh, see none. I will now close general public comment for this evening. Mr. Mayor, Councilman Menard. Well, before we leave public comment, um, I want to thank the city manager and the city attorney for clarifying the Brown Act advice. I heard a couple of meetings ago from those who went down to Long Beach. Um, I think what you heard was trumped by the advice from the city attorney. I totally agree with the city attorney. Do you know how he how he stepped in? Because I, I, it's, it's not important. Excuse it's not, me. It's not important. With all due respect, it's not on the agenda. You can save it for council. And, and, and my suggestion is you might want to look at the language for for public comment and try to conform it to the advice from the city attorney. We don't sit here as stone statutes. We can speak. Would you like to continue your comments, Councilman Arnold? That's it. No? I'll continue on. Uh, Councilman Kaiser. Um, yes. Uh, and I really want to commend and make sure that everybody got wind of that. The, uh, the SiskiyouFarmCo.com. It's a place where you can buy local goods. I think that is just amazing. I commend them. That was really cool. Um, steampunk update. It was excellent. Uh, we, after we put this event on the committee, we seem to think that maybe we're going to gear it down just for a one day event for next year uh, and just go like, you know, absolutely crazy for the one day. So that was a, a, something that I was wanting to bring back. Um, uh, there was one thing that really uh, was inspiring during the steampunk event. We had a man that sat there with the kids and all day long for two days, built stuff with these kids, you know, uh, educated them with the electricities. I watched them stick wires on a battery and make the fan come on and they were absolutely amazed. And uh, that man is here, that's Dwight Bailey. And I'm personally, publicly, commending you and thanking you for what you put up with, with those children <laughs> was absolutely amazing. You should get some kind of award, sir. Okay. Uh, and thank you for doing it. That was awesome. Um, and the other thing that I would like to put out there is we got a lot of road work going on right now. And I was kind of asked by a couple of the road guys I could put out there to people, please be a little understanding. Um, our roads are getting fixed. They're doing the best they can. Please have a little patience. When you see the cone zones, slow down a little bit. These guys all have babies and children that they want to get home to too. So I'm asking, please have a little compassion and please slow down during the construction, during or in the construction zones. That's about all I got now, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, sir. Right. Thank you, Councilman Kessler. I'm a little confused now. I thought we were going to hear from staff and then the council member. Well, you started us off. off. You kind of started us off in this. Well, I was on comments. item four. I wasn't on item five. So I have several items. Oh, okay. Well, please share. I also thought you wanted to run public hearing for public comment. I closed public comment and then Councilman Art wanted to yeah. it. So is there public comment or not? There was public comment. You did not come to the podium. Public comment is closed. Councilman Arf, please continue with your comments for this evening. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the mayor and the city manager because we actually held a pre-agenda review for this meeting. Uh, we met in person for over an hour uh, per the protocols, and I thought it was highly valuable. 
to get to be able to speak to the mayor and the city manager in the context of the next agenda. So thank you for reinstituting that practice. No problem. Uh, we had a harvest party at the community garden across the street last Saturday. It was a lovely day, a lovely event. And what I learned is childcare is a big issue in our community. And throughout the summer, the Community Resource Center has provided child care for up to 17 kids from newborn to two year old hmm. in the safe space of the garden. Uh, they have their own little kitchen where they can make mud pies. They <laughs> learn about putting a seed in the ground and seeing what happens, uh, including the pumpkins that we grew across the street that they got to carve up last Saturday. So I, you know, the city of Dunsmuir supports the Dunsmuir Community Resource Center, and I'm so proud that we all do. Thank you. Uh, the third item is, as we come toward November 11th, Veterans Day, uh, I would hope that we could have a parade with the Honor Guard that was at the Railroad Days Parade, I would hope we could have a brief parade. I promise probably five veterans in our community that we will do something, having done nothing last year. But if we could do a parade to the cemetery, and I would hope the mayor would come, I'd hope the vice mayor would come, I would hope veterans would come, and we could start a tradition. Uh, I'm happy to help, but I'm not gonna do it all by myself. Uh, and that's it. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Right. Councilman Lucchese. Thank you. Uh, just really quick, uh, Blake or Dustin, do we have an update on the children's park equipment purchase? I know Blake, I think prior to your arrival, was having issues connecting with game time on ordering that equipment and scheduling the installation. So I'm just hoping that we can get on that because I know that grant spending deadline is coming up. Um, and if you need help making connections with them, I can sort through my emails um, to get the contact that we were working with and the quotes okay. that we had previously got from them. I'll follow up on it. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll go through and make a note to send emails that I've had previously sent to me about that because we should probably get that done. Um, I would like to also revisit the Parks and Recreation. Um, it was made aware to me by other residents, not just Allison, that they were looking forward to having more meetings regarding park improvements. Um, there's a lot of interest in what's going on at the rail yard. And then the question I get now is who's going to maintain that? You know, is that going to be part of our parks and trails system? And so I think there's a bigger conversation that needs to continue to happen for that. So I'd like to request that piece uh, moving forward. Um, I'd also like to request a meeting to set priorities with Siskiyou County Economic Development Council. I'm, I'm sorry that they didn't stay for updates, but I didn't feel it was appropriate to request that in the presentation item. Um, but I think they've done a really wonderful job in supporting us over COVID, but a lot of it was just um, reactive response to COVID and supporting businesses. But I think with the amount of money that we give them per year, it would be nice to get on the same page and understand the priorities um, that we would like our money used for. Um, and projects that we would like supported, for example, local foods, um, some of the other pieces that we've talked about with our, our composting and green waste program. Um, so it'd be really nice to get on the same page with them to kind of work okay. a little bit more collaboratively on what projects we pick and work on in the future. Uh, finally, uh, the California Office of Emergency Services launched a Prepare California Jumpstart grant program. Um, which is a competitive grant process, but it closes tomorrow. It only had an opening window of three weeks. Um, but it, what it would do is if granted, we would get a million dollars over five years to hire an individual to focus specifically on hazard mitigation and disaster resiliency. Um, it would go towards supplies, pay and uh, benefits uh, with the over a five year period with the hope that they could assist us with um, any level of disaster and hazard preparedness, which includes climate adaptation, green waste programming, flood reduction, um, stormwater, different pieces like that. So I'm trying to finish that application and get that in. Um, 
from the council to move forward. There's no match for the grant, so it would not be any um, cost to um, the staff. And so I've been putting that together on my free time so that we don't waste any time or money on it since we have no appropriations for applying for that grant. Um, but hopefully uh, we can be super competitive. Um, our wildfire percentile is that we're in the 96th. Um, so we have a really good chance of being a good applicant. Um, and the only other um, agency in Siskiyou County that I know is applied is Wairika. So I'm hoping that we can um, be really competitive on that and get that in. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman Lucas. Oh, I apologize. Um, I completely forgot where I was for like the last week. Uh, so I attended the American Planning Association uh, state conference and actually had a really good conversation. There was a diversity summit on the first day that talked about California's history of sundown towns, which is the uh, deliberate practice of municipalities throughout uh, California's kind of establishment using municipal code and zoning codes to prohibit people of color in towns after sundown and uh, talked to a Chinese American scholar from uh, Scripps College down in um, Anaheim and uh, talking to him about Dunsmere. And actually uh, Dunsmere does have a history of Chinese Americans and Chinese immigrants coming over to um, work on the railroad. And uh, the individual runs a podcast um, that actually looks at different cities throughout the state of California and looks at the history that's around those pieces. Uh, and, and Dunsmere is actually on their docket to talk about on their podcast. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm hoping, um, you know, there's a really cool opportunity to explore some of the multiculturalism around our railroad history, even if it is a little bit macabre sometimes. Uh, but I think it's a really important piece of history that shouldn't be forgotten just because we want to celebrate the good things about the railroad. There were also pretty terrible things about the railroad. Um, we, we talk about, I mean, our own Cantera spill in 1991, which is actually one of the worst chemical spills in US history. So uh, at least on a railroad line. So, you know, it's, it, it's another aspect that, you know, we could really start to lean into and, and take ownership of uh, moving forward. So hopefully I can come back with some programming around that. Thank you, Councilman Lucchesi. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, give an update on an event I attended. Um, it, most of you are aware that the uh, League of California Cities has 16 divisions. We're part of what's called the Sacramento Division, and I'm a one of the two representatives for the area here. Um, and so they had a, a, a game where they have regular membership meetings to get together with um, people who support the League of California Cities, corporations and such. And uh, so they had a, a game uh, um, down for the River Cats in Sacramento. Uh, I went down there, drove down there in the afternoon, got back at one o'clock in the morning, that was fun. But the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I was able to uh, talk with one of the program managers with the company. The company is called Veneer, V-A-N-I-R. And it's a company that does uh, major projects, installations for cities. And I was talking with this one fellow, Kurt Weidem, Weedem, and it turns out he's another Notre Dame guy. So we were talking and I, I explained that we have this uh, airport and we're looking at doing an industrial park or some sort of development. And uh, so he reached out to me and um, uh, put me in touch with, or he's gonna be putting me in touch with a company called K2 Development out of Reading, which does this type of work. Right now they're very involved with a bunch of projects but I sent him along a copy of the video that was done back in 19, where we talked about the industrial park and he's gonna have him check into it and look and see if there's some way that we can start kickstarting something there. So I'm hoping that uh, drive down there and back again and they didn't play very well. They lost like eight to nothing. But in any case, uh, I hope that might bear some fruit down the line. Um, and uh, let's see. The rest of it would be for DPAC. Um, so I'll just wait for committee reports. I will say though, that with regards to the public comment, the reason that came from the city manager and the city attorney was because I reached out personally to the city attorney. And so after that, what he replied was sent to everybody. So as I read what he wrote, it doesn't mean that we can just chit chat back and forth afterwards or during, but it says that if you're asking a particular question with a particular answer in mind that doesn't have to do with any business of the council, then you can respond. But it said that even then the chair should be the one 
making the determination. So I would just say that it's not as clear and it's just a matter, I think, of being sensitive to the idea that we're not supposed to discuss items that are on the agenda and I'll leave it at that. Sure. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Deutsch. Um, on that note, I just wanna remind everyone, um, we intended to do a training with our city attorney, with both the city council and planning commission. Um, tentatively, we're looking at dates in early November, um, early to mid November for that. Uh, so just be aware that that is coming up. Um, as regards to um, Brown Act training, we figure it's good to revisit. Uh, we were able to participate, those that were at the conference with ethics training, but the requirements for everybody involved here. So good to make a practice of it, particularly with the city manager uh, less familiar with California law. So it's going to be geared towards Dunsmere specifically. Um, and he wasn't able to attend the Brown Act done at the conference anyway, so um, that would be good for him. Well, and the Planning Commission is also a Brown Act committee, uh, one that doesn't interact necessarily as often or as formally, but it's good for them to be aware of all that. All the rules. Yeah, I mean, the... it's just healthy. Um, particularly, John's excited about um, tailoring a two-hour training for the city, so there's nothing in it that doesn't really relate to how we operate. Um, so very excited for that. Um, as regards to public comment this evening, I do apologize it was already closed, uh, but happy to field any questions after the meeting personally, um, where you can send any inquiries to our city manager or myself. Uh, my email is on the website. All right. Uh, I know we have uh, several guests. Hey, this is Mayor. Yes. Um, you might want to check with your city manager and your police chief for the reports and stuff. You know, I wasn't in it. Come on. <laughs> Um, I going to say we have people uh, waiting from different time zones, so I'm going to end my comments here and turn it over to our city manager. All right. So uh, in the last, uh, it's been a crazy busy last couple of weeks, uh, primarily as, as uh, Council Member Keisler mentioned, um, a lot of road work going on. We're trying to get streets closed up before winter. And so um, we have just in the mix of everything, it's been kind of chaotic, but we appreciate all the patience of of everybody and and yes please slow down um but the the work is uh the work is uh keeps on moving um the tank project is uh we are i just signed paperwork today to allow for a a, a winter closure a winter cl hold and then extend the project through the winter um just uh the, just timing of everything they weren't able to quite get it closed up and and everything we needed and and uh, we opted to not do um some of the pipe work underneath of uh, coming up to the tank due to uh, timing of being able to get asphalt and covering it back up before winter. So we wanted to make sure we had the, all of that stuff uh, um, taken care of. Um, spent primary, most of my time is spent around uh, Public Works in the last couple of weeks, uh, Public Works building, just kind of trying to vet some properties so I can bring them back to the committee. Um, and then uh, also with streets and water. And uh, so, you know, we have a, there's a big hole down here on the end. And uh, I want to apologize publicly for the extended uh, water outage, uh, specifically for the high school. I know we're probably their hero this week because they didn't have school on Monday, but that was, that was completely unplanned. We had a few challenges getting the water shut off so we could actually get the valve changed out. So um, it took about four hours to get all the water shut down to where we could uh, take the pipe out and uh, re put the valve in, so, um, which was not, not planned. And so it took uh, until about noon rather than about 8 a.m. like we originally planned. So, um, but uh, everything's good there and they're moving forward. And so uh, I also, uh, last night I attended the, uh, the Chamber uh, Pine Street uh, Business Social, I guess you could call it, and uh, got to meet a lot of the community members and, uh, and business, business owners. And it was just a nice little event. and. Uh, the, the food was good. I was, I was going to ask you, how was the food? The food was great. Bag you later. Yes. So, thank you so much. Um, right. uh, two questions. Sure. One is, before you took your seat, the council unanimously passed a resolution to landmark the California theater. And we voted on it with the proviso it needed to have review from the city attorney and it needed to be recorded against the property. And I just wonder if that's happened yet. I, not completely. We're checking on it. And that was, I had a conversation with him earlier today and that's probably why he wanted to do public comment, but I. 
I, I thought I handled it uh, prior to council meeting, but you must have had more to say. So the, the second item is I live on Sacramento Avenue. I have a number of businesses on Sacramento Avenue. And now there's a series of small orange cones in front of one of Mr. Juarez's properties, the Castle Rock Hotel. The sidewalk is tremendously heaved and cracked. He's been notified already. And uh, that's are, are supposed to be corrected. Are those cones or his cones or what? I don't know for sure. They might be his. Okay. Um, but he was notified of the, of the broken up uh, sidewalk. And so that is taken care of. Oh, one other thing I wanted to note is, so um, we have, uh, I've been working with Union Pacific and, and kind of uh, navigating some of that truck traffic and stuff here down on Sacramento. And we're gonna look at sending out some notifications shortly, but we will have some parking limitations in certain areas where it's very narrow and uh, there, will, there will be signage and we will tow. Um, just so that's out there. And so we will, we'll notify those property owners, but where it gets kind of narrowed down here at the bottom of Cedar and then right coming down the hill to Pine, uh, those areas will be limited on parking once they start uh, ramping up their uh, truck operations. That zone will handle the truck. Well, could please share with uh, council what you told me regarding um, New Pacific uh, agreeing to cover the costs. Yeah, so right. So we did do a, we did do a kind of a video high high resolution video road survey um, that uh, was completed uh, last Thursday, maybe Friday. Um, I haven't got an update on it yet, but uh, Union Pacific did agree to pay for that, and then we will go back and do that same thing after the completion of their of their primary hauling, and so we're we're looking at approximately fifty trucks a day for the duration of the project. Uh, inbound uh, loaded. So that means whether they're coming down Sacramento to the upper yard or from the up north yard to the south yard, about somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 50 plus trucks. Any additional questions? If they screw up, they pay for it, the road. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that so again, going back to the discussion we just had about Brown Act, I mean, that also pertains to comments. So we're not supposed to discuss items that are not duly noted on the agenda. So if we could limit that, please. Uh, please, Chief Ortiz. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the steampunk event was awesome, took, took a ton of fun, no problems as far as law enforcement is concerned. Uh, uh, town's in good shape. Uh, I'm glad to be made aware of the issues uh, that Public Works has been having with traffic in regards to road construction areas. Uh, I'll pass it on to the deputies. Have a better presence of that. Um, we've, I finally, I think I got the county to rewire our substation for us. You know, modern computer, I, I'm not a tech person, boards, <laughs> cables, wires. Things. Things. <laughs> so uh, the hope is that nobody will snare themselves while walking and catch themselves up in the sports cables, wires, or things. <laughs> Resemble more of professional government style. I'm not pretty excited to get that done. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for that report. Right. Um, move the issue committee reports. DPAC. Um, three things coming out of DPAC right now. First of all, um, I know that they've communicated with the city manager he's set to do this, but they're asking for a mailing, as we talked about before, to go out to the entire 96025. And uh, the mailing would include two items. One would be a map of Zone Haven to remind, let people know about their zones and then either a separate piece of paper or a second on the back would be um, information about flooding because with everything happening with flooding around nowadays, uh, we probably need to bring that to mind. They had done some work on that early in the beginning of DPAC and now they're bringing it back up and they wanna get the word out. So uh, that'll be working. Um, on the alarm system, um, uh, Jason Young has helped me, got together, we, we identified the companies that make them so we can move forward with the grant process and I'll be processing that going ahead. So the idea is we had to identify the various companies that make alarms so that we could then go ahead and, and put out what the, the ultimate cost would be comparing the different items. So I'll be working that. 
One other thing that came up, and I've reached out to Blake about this, and eventually I'll probably reach out to Bryce Craig, um, and I'll, I'll mention it later on talking about the conference, but um, I think what, what CORE did here with their pilot program and the number of, uh, I think it's 45 different properties, something like that, that they've already done and done the, the uh, hardening on, um, I came up with the idea of seeing if Pusher would like to do some kind of a video on, on this, because again, it's supposed to be a pilot program and we could, uh, on one hand, um, help them promote what they're doing as core in terms of their mission. And on the other hand, I think we could also include it as a possible uh, Putnam Award um, for um, what we're doing here in the city. So I, I'm going to be looking forward to see if we could come up with a video that talks about the project, what they did, and, and kind of puts us on the spotlight for having participated in that. So that's what's going on with DPAC right now. Thank you. Any questions? Well, I, uh, no, no questions. But for solid waste, um, I think for our next meeting, and Juliana is chair of the Solid Waste Committee, we need to have the city manager attend with the notion up until SB 1383. Clements waste disposal provided all the disposal services and all mm -hmm. the work was a billing agent for them, including setting rates. Now we have a statewide mandate that's leading us toward green waste, food disposal, bottles and cans, and it's going to involve the Public Works Department. It's going to involve our agreement to be part of the Siskiyou County collaborative that reports to the state. We have a three-year window, uh, so we need to be in compliance. We took our rural waiver. We need to be in compliance, I think, by January. By other people, is this a committee report or is this something you just want to make sure is on the agenda for the next? Well, meeting? we've almost lost the window for doing significant green waste reduction. We appropriated $5,000 for green waste reduction. And I don't know if we're going to try to do it this year. It's going to roll over to next year. So we'll just make sure that that's on the agenda for that committee. And I believe, and Blake, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're scheduled to meet next Monday. Yes, we are, but that is Indigenous Peoples Day, FYI. Are, are you guys off that day? Yes. Oh, um, then let's get together and make sure that we reschedule that since we have um, not had that meeting for a while. Okay. Um, if it's possible to do that later in the week, please. And thank you. Thank yeah. You. I thought that the that was a next meeting was a finance committee. No, uh, finance committee was supposed to meet this Monday, but uh, Blake sent out an email that he wanted more time to work on the budget, and that we canceled this past Monday's meeting. Uh, yeah, I know that. I thought it was going to be. It's not. So no, okay. it'll be the Monday after. This finance committee um, no. clearly delved into the audit. We have uh, discussed the audit and gone over the audit, but Blake, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe we have issued a recommendation or anything on the audit. Uh, so prior year's audit, uh, so 63021, uh, that one's been you know accepted, but we were going through it. Yes. Uh, you may have some recommendations further going forward with that, but uh, uh, just an update, I am working on the 63022 audit. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we did we did discuss the 21. We did not come up with recommendations or conclude it. Um, and then we were waiting for the most recent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any additional committee reports? No. Um, I, informally, I, I definitely been doing a lot of work um, researching uh, public works building locations as well. Uh, trying to get together a point where the committee can meet and come back with recommendations sooner rather than later. It's, it's going to be a longer process than um, the committee coming back to council once. Um, we've got a couple of options and we'll have a committee meeting soon. Okay, look forward to it. All right. Uh, then let's move into the approval of the minutes for September 15th. I make a motion to approve the minutes for September 15th, 2022. Second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Against? 
motion carries unanimously. All right, um, then we move into the consent agenda for this evening. We have the check register from September 10th through September 30th. Update authorized Sanders on LAFE, local agency investment fund account. Uh, recommend transfer of decommissioned fire hydrants to surplus property and sell for scrap metal. Mr. Mayor, before I make a motion to adopt the consent agenda, <coughs> is there any way we can discuss item C? Um, I'd you be happy to move it to new business item A if you'd like it. Yeah, for new business. There would be new business item C. Okay, well, new business item C. Thank you very much. All right. Well, on that note, then I'll make a motion to adopt the consent agenda as amended. Second. All right. Um, motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Against? Motion carries unanimously. We have no public hearing uh, this evening, and we have no old business. So this brings us uh, to our new business for this evening. Item A, downtown Wi-Fi project. Council calls um, at a time when city staff did not have a great deal of bandwidth for further research. Um, you blessed myself and Councilman Deutsch, uh, who is the one that really began uh, this exciting research project, uh, to look into how we can here and now uh, help bridge the digital divide and bring more access um, and be better situated to participate in the world of high-speed internet. So um, looking into specifically how we bring uh, Wi-Fi hotspots to our downtown. Um, there's actually a lot involved with this project, but we're excited to have the uh, only company that responded to us positively um, as far as building this. We've been working for three months now, um, first on the engineering, what would be practical, uh, kind of keeping an eye out the costs too. Things have changed and shifted. Uh, but for tonight, you know, there's a lot to take in here. So it's gonna be more getting you guys up to speed on what it would look like. Um, I will say the cost we have not firmly um, determined yet. We started off looking somewhere closer to 2,600 a month. Um, it looks like we're gonna be able to get them below 2,000 to keep that in your mind, but I'm really excited to share with it this evening. Um, and Bruce, do you have anything to add as far as the introduction goes? Uh, well, I just wanna identify that we have Vince Rennick here from the company yeah. and we have all the people online that'll be go over and going over the discussion. And so I, I'll leave it to the mayor to kick it yeah. off. So Vince, if you'd like to come up here, I have not personally had the pleasure, but I know you've interacted with the town uh, many times before. Yeah, if I could, uh, just to point that out, um, the reason I know Vince is that about four years ago, he was working, he was the head of uh, uh, Northland. And when the three cities got together and hired a consultant, he was intimately involved in that. So now we're a little further down the line and that's all. Okay, all right, well, welcome. Thank you. We are. Thank you for your time. Um, we are a little bit further down the road, Bruce. Uh, I am currently the director of Advanced Commercial Services for Vive Broadband in its Northwest region, and I think we have out there in the ether some of my fellow teammates who are going to do a presentation to you tonight about the proposed downtown Wi-Fi. So, without stealing any of their thunder, but I'll be around. I can stick around for after the meeting, or I live up in Mount Shasta, so. I'm available for further questions. Okay. So with that, thank you so much, Vince. Well, I'll here. take take it from there just to introduce myself. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Yes. All right. So my name is Gary Sweet. I'm the commercial engineer involved in the design on this project. Uh, some of my partners on here, I have Nick Kamara. He was my co-designer on this. We've got Tammy Lang here. She's the commercial sales director with us. And I have Craig Seibel. He's our Vive Technology Solutions Director. And so quite a few people, if you need to ask any questions, I can divert some of those questions to some and I'll take some of those. But if you guys have a screen where I can share my uh, share my screen. We, we do, if we okay. can give them access. Wendy, you might need to not make me co-host and make Gary co-host. And I got three screens going here. So just let me know what you see on there. <laughs> Technology, right? All right, share. Now I'm gonna start off with the basics on the maps. So to get started, basically, you know, the big 
tricky part to designing a Wi-Fi system for a citywide area is, is truly the real estate, the, the mere square footage involved in it. Um, so the way you distribute that signal, that's the important part. Now, some people will take a wireless access point and do it point to point through the air and you'll lose a lot of throughput by doing that. And so that's not the ideal way. So how do you get a direct wired connection from one access point to another access point over long distances? And that's where Vive has actually come into the place here. We're, we're uniquely positioned. We're, we're already a communications company that's been doing business in, in uh, down, Dunsmere, whether it be residential or commercial for decades. Whether well, first it was Northland and now Vive. And so we're positioned on those telephone poles already with fiber in place. Now in this particular project, we're gonna utilize that fiber, but it allows us to, and, and run some new fiber, but it allows us to get access points to strategic locations. We worked hand in hand with the, the manufacturer for access points, uh, what Ruckus, where we'll be using some of their T-series access points, which are very high powered access points and running fiber optics out to each of those. So we'll be having fiber that already comes in right up here at the top, uh, um, top up of the corner of Shasta. And we're gonna be running down both sides of the street with fiber. And we're gonna run some new fiber to get the access points out here. Access points strategically placed on these buildings over here with the main brain of it inside the council chambers. Now we currently have fiber in the council chambers. In this project, we'll be bringing fiber over to city hall as well. Uh, fiber will be coming over to the library. Um, was the library community resource center community resource center and then also just to drag over here we've added in the dunsmere parks and recreations in here now all of these access points are going to be operating on a mesh network and what that means is each access point will work in unison with each each other access point so you won't have multiple different um, you, you know, wireless names, they're all going to be working in a mesh together. Mm -hmm. So when you go from one access point to the other access point, your, your device isn't even going to see why, right? And so I just wanted to go through kind of some of the basics of that setup there so that we can kind of understand the logistics of this. Now, one of the things that does benefit the city is in bringing fiber out here. The, the difficult part when we're looking at getting fiber to a business, aside from the wireless, uh, wireless setup, a direct fiber connection to a business is the best kind of internet you can have. And the difficulty where it comes with price is usually getting the construction process of getting the fiber to the building. And in this process, we're gonna be putting splice cases in along the business district. And that makes it so that we can actually get fiber to those businesses on an individual connection, much, much easier without as much construction. So it benefits each of the businesses involved in getting a direct fiber connection set up. However, for the district, it, it puts out a, a full wireless wireless network that all the citizens in the downtown corridor are able to use. And I think what started it when I first started talking was the lack of uh, cell phone signal as you're going through. And, and I've witnessed that when I'm you know going down the street is, is the cell phone signal not being very good. Uh, so while you're going down the street and you wanna connect to your devices, order some food, whatever it is technologically wise that you wanna connect to, not having that signal, is, is kind of a hindrance, and this would solve that particular issue. Mr. Mayor, point? Uh, can we let him finish his presentation? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Was there a question? No, uh, we're, we're reserving questions till later. Okay. So now that we kind of understand that sheer map, I got a PowerPoint presentation to just briefly go over here. So we've worked in close partnership with the city of Dunsmuir to develop an intense wireless access system for the downtown corridor. The purpose is to del deliver a reliable wireless internet to anyone visiting the downtown area. Just to so let you know, like Gary, we're still just staring at the Google Earth map. Oh. He has a presentation that he switched over to. Oh. It's a new thing on Zoom that when you switch your windows, it doesn't automatically switch anymore. You have to deliberately like hit the share button, which is weird that they changed that. We're, we usually use Teams. So. Yeah. No, it's it, it's happening to everybody. And now it's not coming up at all. No, we're, we're still looking at the KMC here. Okay, I got this. There you go. This happened to me like two weeks ago on a Zoom call and they're, they're like, yeah, we didn't see any of your presentation the entire time. And I was like, all right, cool. Well, I will say thank you for saying that because I was going to go on with the <laughs> presentation as if you could see it. So. 
Yeah, it's okay. All right. However, I'm not seeing my presentation come up as a screen to share. Hmm. While he's doing that, the one thing I was going to point out yeah. is, is that um, uh, if you're not aware of it, it should be obvious. They're going to be putting the cost in putting in all the development. We're not paying anything for that. We in turn have a, a, a contract length and uh, the cost then depends on the contract length. But um, again, all of the actual installation will be done by the company. And so that means we don't have to put that money out. Okay, it's up now, Gary. Yeah, we're okay. good. All right. So I basically just wanted to run through it. Um, as I said, building out this network brings the fiber closer to every single business over there on the downtown quarter. Um, makes, makes you be able to get, to get to those businesses a lot easier. The way we deliver this is through... The ruckus access point is the T series, very, very sleek. If can you guys all see this? Yeah. It's weatherized, weatherproof, can be rained on, be snowed on, can operate in the heat, in the intense heat. Uh, it's enclosed with an incredibly powerful antenna. Uh, working with ruckus, we actually did a heat map on the city to find out the most uh, uh, the most coverage it's gonna get, the, the best coverage it's gonna get over here. And that covers the entire downtown corridor over here with a missing piece right in here that there was nothing there to cover. Now it's going to bleed over into this spot, but your best coverage is right in between these. Now it's also going to bleed over into the residential area, but with a you know, lower signal, not as, not as intense as right in here. Um, you're going to get your best coverages in there and all the devices are going to be able to connect. Ruckus is able to connect thousands of users. There's microprocessors in each of these access points that are able to handle that traffic. And I've got Craig Seibel on here that can kind of speak to that. Uh, but I kind of want to give you the, the sleek look. The, the idea is to go ahead and put these access points up on the building, connected uh, through a Cat5 cable that goes through the business, down in and plugged into a fiber switch. And that power over Ethernet switch is going to power up that antenna. So where we put it, we won't require power, but inside the business, we will. And then that encompasses, like I said, the, uh, the downtown corridor and the parks and recreations pool area. Now, some of the, the benefits to this, I just kind of wanted to highlight a few. One is, is in helping create economic development in the Dunsmere community, uh, allowing citizens to access, access to services at no charge that gives them the ability to use technology that they might not have otherwise been able to use. Partnering with the city allows the community to access, access to the robust of fiber optic network without the worry of maintenance and upfront costs. And like you'd mentioned, no upfront costs. We're covering the, the bill on the construction, all the parts, the setup, and the maintenance. And partnering with Vibe will ensure that the Wi-Fi network is current and up-to-date as technology changes and involves. So a part breaks, we come out and we fix it. Technology evolves as it always does. We come out and evolve with it. Um, and this is at no cost to the city. So Vive has been a, a vital part of providing communication services to the residential and business community in Dunsmere for decades. This is just one more way that we can serve. And so with that, I wanted to kind of open it up to questions and I'll kind of divert that off to the team as, as some of those questions will be directed. I have many. Okay, yeah. throw them on. Okay. Um, okay. I think the first and foremost, you know, how, you know, as we put the system together, what is Vive's role in cybersecurity management of the network and what steps are we going to take? And this is to the group as well, but what steps are we going to take to ensure cybersecurity while people are using the open wireless because it is a huge cybersecurity threat? Um, it's something talked about a lot in municipal governments that offer this in downtowns that ones who did not think of that have had their networks basically hijacked by people utilizing it to hack people on the system. Um, so how are we kind of covering that? Good question. That one I want to divert to Craig if you're available there. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us this evening. And uh, security is definitely uh, an important part of a public access solution. So first and foremost, uh, whether, you know, when we're, we're deploying these solutions, a piece of that that's really important is uh, protecting each individual client as they're connecting to get that uh, internet access so they can 
do what they need to do. So the, uh, the technology that's involved in this solution, it's, it's called client isolation. And really what the idea is that every client that connects is isolated on their own separate logical network. And what that does is that provides them a logical separation from, from the other users that are on the network, whether it's one user, 10 users, 100 users, 1,000 users, right? Each one of them is designed to have their own separate access, their funneled connection to the internet to where they can connect to the internet, get what they need to get, pull that internet, pull that access down and move forward um, without being able to communicate cross to other devices that are still connecting to that same wireless network. So client, client isolation is huge and it's a part of the wireless network. Uh, the other pieces that we also leverage for security are um, you know, based on the considerations and the communications we have you know, with the city and the municipalities saying, hey, what are your needs? What are your desires for filtering content? You know, what are your parameters? Do we want to filter X, Y, Z? You guys provide what it is that's going to filter. There's certain things that are going to be available on the wireless network. There's certain things that are going to be considered taboo. We don't want to have access to those. We can identify those and create those filters based on that content. We can filter based on applications. Hey, there are certain applications that consume a lot of bandwidth, or they're just not considered um, necessary or or desirable, you know, by by the the city, and we can we can filter those out as well by application, whether it's certain social media, all social media, or whatever. With that being just one example, so so we have a, quite a bit of granularity when it comes to security. To from the point of isolating each individual client to individual to filtering applications and filtering content to make sure that all our users that are accessing this public system are accessing it safely and securely. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, no, that, that, that was very helpful. And in terms of um, limiting content, is there an ability as opposed to like just not allowing people onto certain applications or certain areas um, do we throttle them instead? So for example, we can allow people to get onto their Netflix account if they're, you know, sitting out on a park bench, but it's at a much slower rate because we know that those streaming sites consume a lot more than a others. Absolutely. Right. You know, okay. if I'm just browsing the web and, you know, and, and my kid next to me is, is streaming Netflix, well, you know, he's going to, he's going to be pulling a lot more than I am. So, uh, you know, throttling can, can be done in a lot of different fashions, whether it's, whether we're throttling per client access per, per client connection, or we're throttling by application type, you know, it, it all, it, it's, it's all just a flavor and a type. We can design it either way to, so we have all those granular controls. There's so many knobs on, on this dashboard, so to speak, but yeah, it can be done either way uh, at whatever, whatever uh, um, request you all have. Well, okay. um, on that note, because a lot of these questions came up in our early meetings, um, could you guys uh, explain to the rest of council what the general capacity of this would be unthrottled? 1,000 1, megs, it'd be one, one gig circuit symmetrical, so up and down. Okay. Um, so we'd be able to have thousands of discrete users. Yeah. yeah. And now also to say that uh, there's going to be segregated what we call VLANs, uh, virtual local area ne network access. So there's going to be a wireless VLAN that's specifically for the open network for the customers. And that'll have client AP isolation, as, as Craig was talking about. We're going to put in a separate <laughs> wireless VLAN that's a secured network, and that would be specifically for the city. Uh, now that can be used if we're going to put up any, if you, you were going to put up any cameras, you could utilize that network for that camera, um, for, the, for the, the purpose of those cameras, or to get from one facility to another facility, um, to Network City Hall, to say the council chambers, that sort of thing. And so they're going to be segregated into different networks with the client's network being um, an API isolation, meaning that no, no other device can see each other. If that, that makes sense, yeah. Could you uh, also cover the concept of the landing page and how that would be useful to us? Yes, and so what that means is, and, and we just basically get a website from you, um, whatever web, web URL you want to give us. And when a customer comes on, they'll you know ask to connect to the network. It's going to give them you know, the terms and conditions they accept. It's going to land them on whatever page you want them to see, whatever web page URL you want them to see. 
um, and they'll have to go to that page before they continue surfing the web. And with that page, you can put in your, your list of community events, upcoming events, concerts, uh, city, city council meetings, different events, whatever you want to put on that page. All we would need is the URL, URL to put in there, the web page, and it would land every customer that comes onto that network to that site, redirect them to it. Thank you. This is kind of more for the committee, but you know, with certain wireless networks that are managed by municipalities or public entities, there's sometimes a tiered service plan. So if people did want to use a larger capacity, they could opt into paying a fee for that. Was that explored by the committee at all? Or is that something that's potentially possible with this? Um, we did not explore that one specifically. We did explore the idea of selling advertisement on the splash page um, okay. or just using it for city advertisement, et cetera. Well, it's just kind of a thought, you know, if you do want to make this self-sufficient offering something where if we did throttle, say, streaming sites and someone is, you know, in their sprinter van and, and parked on a city street overnight, which is, you know, again, people do that, mm -hmm. um, you could charge them a certain premium to allow them to stream that if they're willing to pay that. I think that'd be a great avenue to look into. A big concern of the committee and working with us was like on the one hand, just trying to provide as much free access as possible, more thinking of our you know citizens. Um, because it's kind of two sides to this. One is just, you know, it's it's this modern era. There's a lot of people that come to Dunsmere, and for them not being able to use their cell phone or gain access immediately, uh, it kind of taints the town for them mm -hmm. as far as being backwards, older, not somewhere where they could see themselves coming back, thriving. Uh, but then there's the people that are here. And we view this project as kind of a continuation of say the, the internet access provided at the library mm -hmm. or the resource center. Um, so it's not that those won't be there. In fact, that's a whole nother aspect of what we've been working on, but it'll expand that and maybe free up say the resource computers for only people that need help, help applying. Yeah. If they know how to and have a device, they could be virtually anywhere in the downtown and have that. So um, I love the idea though. I think we could look into that. I just would be careful to not limit access for low-income households that maybe need to rely on this. Okay. Yeah. And then finally, has the committee considered um, what we're going to do to comply with the historic district architectural standards um, with these devices? I know that's a big discussion with a lot of historic districts. And are we going to do covers for them? Are we going to, you know, plan them into the facade so that they're not visible? Uh, we discussed that um, planning commission would have to review it, but uh, thankfully, we have the option of putting them on top of buildings or on sides. Um, there might be some advantage depending on the building and which one, um, but it, it came up as just something the planning commission would have to review. Okay, thank you, I'm done. One of the benefits to that, just to say too, is that they're not super large devices. They're not like a mini cell phone tower or anything like that. They're pretty sleek in design and pretty sleek in, in size, so easily hidden. Yeah. And thank while you. we're- um, That's a good point though. Julia, looking up for the historical society. This is a great point. I'd like to add a couple more just to part of the presentation. So the splash page was a huge part. Security cameras, you know, we could potentially get some very high tech ones, but this network would allow us to put up very affordable, very simple cameras anywhere within this. Not that we'd want to go obsessive towards that, but I, I do know in talking with, uh, I guess, the three police chiefs I've dealt with here, that increasingly in California, or at least with Siskiyou County's DA, it's so hard to get anything prosecuted unless it is on camera Correct. in the modern world. So a perfect example would be railroad days incident that happened late night. Okay, literally one camera pointed down Main Street would have probably simplified that entire case. And then eventually maybe even be a deterrent. Mm -hmm. um, and then it'd bring fiber to the downtown. So right now, anyone that say wanted fiber in their building well, they'd have to pay to bring it all the way there. This project brings it a lot closer, so it provides a you know kind of tertiary benefit for anyone wanting to come onto the system. Um, as part well, of the, I, I as, like the fact that they're alleviating the cost to the consumer of that. Well, the, the nice thing with the security cameras, uh, potentially, it could open this up to be somewhat. Um, well, we could we could apply public safety funding towards this, you know, proportionate amount. Um, to help with that. But we were very concerned with the costs, not that we have a definite quote, because uh, Vive has definitely been a good partner in trying to reach the point where, you know, I, I've told them many, many times, I don't want you to lose money on this, but I don't want you to make any either. <laughs> um, you know, we'll be good partners. Um, you guys won't lose money. They already are the foremost internet company in our town. Um, they have 
I just got the numbers today, uh, 900, sorry, 690 residential users and 38 businesses. So they are the ones with the network right here, right now already. Part of the reason this seems to work as a partnership. But um, I was concerned about our own city facilities not having adequate internet. And we've gotten by slowly, but it's, you know, the, the world is moving forward very fast. So we've actually included this um, one, one gigabyte um, fiber to council chambers building uh, included for free or you know, with the package, city hall, library, and community resource center. Wow, we great. also have that. And we're continuing to discuss the options of the uh, public or the water treatment plant. Um, so the sewage plant there doesn't have fiber there and the cost of bringing it down would be um, I and mean, they expensive. probably don't need it either as much there. Well, no, but we're talking about getting them the same download speed. Well, it is important for facilities, especially for wastewater, to have the fiber optic or consistent internet connection mm -hmm. for the SCADA that we um, run okay. that, you know, runs alarms to our well, wastewater actually, tech. Well, since it's one company that we have a deep partnership with, they use our right-of-ways. In exchange, we get 5% of their gross receipts. And now we're trying to move to this next level where we don't have like little outside bills here and there, but we have this bigger relationship um involving all this so it, it is kind of a lot um and it, it went that way just because you know it didn't make sense to have four or five different things but kind of one place where everything's gathered um, and defined so but anyway i didn't want to project i know uh, there's more questions mr mayor a question um how much do we get right now in our um franchise fee from them uh, i don't think they're calling it a franchise fee anymore but i just said uh, five percent Okay, so what I'm, I'm just bringing up before we start talking dollars, one thing we could pull out of our pocket here is to say that right now the franchise fees are going straight into the general fund, and we could in our mind say that we could put the franchise fees towards this and see how that plans out. I just wanted to get that kind of in the back there. Yeah, but I, mean, I, I mean, really quick um, from the financing point, though, we are using those general funds for services now. So we will right. have to give something up yeah. to get this. And it's not just free money. Our right of ways are valuable. Um, sure. We all know. That's well, um, I spent my career in utility regulation and the state of California and the whole nation struggles with the digital divide. We're a low income rural community from old people to school kids. Uh, there are a number of citizens that simply aren't connected to the internet. So as I listen this project sounds like it's either for any visitors or open to all citizens. But what I get is if you're not downtown, this really isn't going to help. Is that right or wrong? That's right. It, correct. You'd have to be in the, you'd have to be within the network. So like within note, the network map that they, yeah, that they showed. That heat map. But we, we have discussed the possibility of expanding on this model if it proves particularly effective. There's no reason we couldn't expand outward. And that leads into the money talk, which is for this partner that you're calling Vibe in the city of Dunsmuir, have you sought to access the significant federal and state money available I, for rural broadband? So, so I have looked into that. And uh, part of the qualifications for that is that you have to have an area that's not served at all. Essentially, they'd have to be on dial-up or, or satellite. And currently, Vive serves already is serving 690 of our our housing units, and uh, so that's a that's we don't meet those qualifications anymore because they consider broadband to be coaxial cable. This is just kind of the next level of what uh, what internet speed can or, or, can or, be. Hey, uh, hey, excuse me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Please proceed. So I had a lengthy discussion with Laurel Harkness, who's on, she's given up her Thursday night to listen in on this because she's a representative of the California governor's office of small business. And I had a lengthy discussion with Laurel and with supervisor Valenzuela last night after the chamber mixer, and they both would like to be involved. Uh, Ed Valenzuela, and I worked on this a decade ago with the three city solution playing off of the buried cable. 
And I think now the view is there's no real advantage to the three city solution. So now Dunsmuir is on its own and we're building whatever we're building, but I'm far more interested in serving underserved citizens than I am tourists. And I'm far more interested in having state and federal funds pay for it because we're small and rural and poor. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you, Councilman. I can speak to a couple of those. Uh, unfortunately, the, the biggest aspect of bridging the digital divide or you know, bringing broadband to where it is not is by any metrics, it is in Dunsmere. Um, subsidizing it is a broader conversation. Uh, we certainly have been talking about it uh, with Vive, not directly with this project, but certain internet providers choose to apply their own subsidy, but subsidies are available for low-income households to apply from the federal government to subsidize their internet. It would be certainly nice to roll that out if you're going to do this project. It certainly it's already out. Well, it, it is out. It'd be nice to promote it. It'd be nice to set up a way that you can apply for it. Wouldn't um, it? Continue that. So um, the idea of the partnership with Vive would be, you know, if we move forward with this, we're going to be working a lot setting it up. But they are the internet provider we use. We're promoting them in the town. In exchange, of course, we'd want them, and they've been open to the idea of helping us roll out all those programs that could be available. So subsidizing low-income households is something that does exist independent of the access. We have the access. Um, to my knowledge, and I've looked into it to some extent, and I, I'm not an authority on this, I have not found anything that brings this, any federal funds for this type of access. No, this is a, a commercial, what would be considered a commercial activity. And, and I'm talking with master engineering for our community. It's like building one room of a house and forgetting what the rest of the house looks like. With the notion of technology, maybe all satellite. Yeah, well, this is a step forward that Dunsmuir can make. And that's quite a remarkable statement. I was I was going into this somewhat skeptical, uh, my own personal opinion on it, uh, just because I I didn't think we'd get it to a point where it was cost effective um, or big enough. So we started off just the downtown. You know, what if we start with something? And then found out that you know, well, we, we should have something up at the post office and grocery store, particularly to serve people in our community. That's an important place where they might need that access. But why shouldn't the grocery store pay for their own access? This is, city for? this is for their patrons. It's this is for people to be able to move around well, in town and be able to pick up their phone and say, what am I going to do next? I'm going to order this. Excuse That's what it's for. Excuse me. Um, one of the major beneficiaries is, of course, anyone trying to do business in Dunsmuir. It's a guest network that they don't have to provide. So it makes us a more business friendly city for all the small businesses struggling to get things going. They have a built in service for their guests. Um, but I really like the idea that it also covers the children's park. That was a major priority, having coverage there. Um, BCT hikers, you know, obviously they're not our core constituency, but it would certainly lend itself to it being a hub for them if they have better access around here. But I'm happy to answer any further questions. Uh, this is still a work in progress, um, but we've gone far enough. We definitely need the full council's input. Mr. Mayor, one other quick thing. So in, in terms of this idea of expanding this beyond the downtown, this is a real mix here. And we were sensitive to the idea that on one hand, the more we put out free stuff into the community, the less money they make because they have customers that they want to sell to. I think that comes with that exact point. I think we all get that. No, I yeah. didn't hear it, but okay. No, it's, it's um, this is something we can do now. We can certainly expand the access to it. Uh, Vive is not afraid uh, that this is going to deteriorate from their business. Um, I've heard it expressed. I mean, happy to jump in here, Tammy, if you'd like to, but um, Heard expressed that there's a great deal of confidence that this just creates a higher profile for them as the internet provider in the area, as they already are. I'm, I'm fine with questions. Did you want to open this for public comment or do you need a decision today? No, this is not for decision today. Unless, okay. like, I think what we're looking for right now is we're not an official committee. We were just blessed by the council to bring something back. We have a city manager on board. Um, I'd like to open up the public comment, but additionally, um, I think we just want direction to our actual staff to take this one over. Okay. Because uh, it's obviously going to be important 
and we're going to need a significant financial analysis to go over. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Thank you. Um, to excuse me, to uh, perhaps answer, answer Council Menard's concerns about uh, low income households, there is a program available, and VIVE does participate in that, where we help offset uh, some of the costs for the uh, broadband access. What I can do is I can have Pia Kowski, who is our office manager, not just contact you okay. if you'd like, so that you can distribute that information to the AT and T and Verizon have the same thing. Yeah, but they choose not to publish it too awfully much. Well, we're we're pretty good about it. We we put it out there. We can put it, it out in most events, and we'd be happy to. If you know, we had our splash page, things. we could advertise it. There you go. I just you have to put yourself in the shoes of the people that don't have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of agree with you. Have to do. Mm -hmm. It's all good, you know. You know my, it's all good for the tourists and everything, and which is, yeah, you know, we're allowing the tourists to find a better pizza or find, you know, whatever. Spend money. But, but the, if you can, if you're going to make it available to the people that can't have that, you know, that, that. Well, it, so it, just a procedurally, we're in public comment. And we've yeah. not gone back to discussion. We're not quite yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. He hasn't gabbled yet. So would you would you like me to have her contact you? Yes, please. Okay. I appreciate Thank that. Thank you. Like that. Um, I'll now open it up to public comment. If anyone would like to make a comment, please come to the podium. If you're on Zoom, please raise your hand. Seeing none, I'll now close public comment. So just for the brevity of our discussion today, because we have two other items and it's almost quarter two. Um, I'm happy to make a motion to have you two work on a resolution to form an ad hoc committee to work on this. And I'd like to see the time frame that you're hoping to have an end project um, considered for this and then what the purpose of the group is just so that we have that clear definition and what we're trying to achieve for this project. So I'm happy to do that if you two are willing to be on an ad hoc to work with staff on this. Sure, we could certainly do that. Um, I'd almost say we're at the point where I think if staff is comfortable taking over the project, um, they have this is going to take a lot of time to get absolutely right. Okay, because that to council, I think it might be better taking from staff at this point. Yeah, more I'm, time efficient. And based on based on all the information we've received, and uh, you know what, we had a pres I had a presentation earlier this week, and and now this one, I feel that confident that Blake and I can can uh, handle that. So, really, what I'm looking for for direction is uh, just uh, that this is something you guys want to continue to explore, and then we can bring back uh some kind of financial analysis here hopefully um late december early january in terms um, of like our priorities with other pieces so just keeping in mind that we do want to have a quarterly parks and rec meeting um i've at correct. least requested a couple of other things is there an ability to put this as a lower priority to those pieces i understand that we don't want to lose momentum but i also want to keep in in check how much we assign to staff it's I think it's we're fairly close. I okay. just I just need to tweak some, just double check, make sure where we're going to pull the funding from, what that looks like, and then bring that back to you guys to okay. as a proposal. Right. Um, the idea is that um, we would want to obviously, if we can't have it in place before the next season, so sometime early spring. So that's kind of the general time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I was kind of hoping to have it in the spring because I think the timeline they gave us was 120 days yeah, from the day we similar. sign it. So. So it was really January. We'd still have time. And yeah, we'd be able to. They'd have it up and ready by April. So a motion to continue the item to a future meeting. Second. Right. Second. Okay. okay. All right. Well, could we have the more specifics to bring back a proposal for consideration? Yeah. So mo motion to continue the item with the end product being a proposal for council consideration. Okay. I'll still second that, President. I I do think. The motion is fine. I do think listening to the presentation, who is the paying customer? Well, it sounds like an amalgam of city offices and non-city users. So as finance looks at this, the budgeting, I don't think ought to be a mishmash. It's just like telephone service or utility service. If it's going to city hall or the fire department, that should be in one budget. If it's for tourists and anybody that's downtown, that's yep. a different budget. Yeah, what we'll, what we'll look at is when we look at the financial analysis, we'll pull up, we've already kind of preliminarily started that. 
based on what we're paying for internet over here and over there and vice all of the, the locations where that's provided. You know, one of the things that I you know want to note is that we are including the resource center, which has been a kind of a core uh, assistance center um, of the community. So, um, but we'll look at the areas that we're already paying and what that that'll play into you know the normal budget and then whatever else is above and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Councilman. Call the question. George. Thanks. Call the, call the question. All right. We didn't technically vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Against? Motion carries. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Vince. everyone from Vive. I really appreciate all the work and being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Time. Sleep well. Um, just, just for the sake of brevity tonight, I don't know how long you guys want to stay here, but I have to still write a grant. Um, could we move up item 11C to be the next item since we have to make a decision and then we'll see how much time we have left for the California League of Cities discussion feedback thing? That's fine with me. It sounds good. Man. Approved. Okay. So Dave, why? Okay. Um, so we, we, uh, took out all these uh, fire hydrants and we replaced all these fire hydrants. And I'm gonna be put it out there bluntly. I'd kind of like to have, be able to buy one of these old fire hydrants from my man cave. I would sign a piece of paper stating that I couldn't put it out in my front yard. And now I'm under the impression, I'm under the understanding that, and that's why I made this motion to, to, to we talk about this. Apparently somebody, got one of these fire hydrants and put it in front of their house for deterrent on parking. Then the same person painted the curb red. The fire hire doesn't work. Why was that ever allowed? And two, uh, if that is the reason why we, nobody can buy a used fire hydrant, that's absurd. I would sign a waiver or promissory note, whatever, that it would never be outside of the house. I'd like to purchase one of these. I know other people want to. I know somebody else has got a bitch and dog idea for a fire hydrant. It's a great idea. Why are people not allowed to buy a fire hydrant if they're not planning on putting it in their yard up next to a curb to where it looks like it's live and to fool people or whatever the case is? Okay, but I believe we have the answer. It's yeah, so, so I was had the discussion internally and we originally were planning to do a raffle or something along that lines. And after a discussion with the fire chief and his strong concerns, um, there was a community south of us that had, didn't matter whether they signed a paper or not, there was a fire hydrant that was placed in the front yard um, on a fire. And uh, incidentally, it caused a delay in uh, them to get water to a fire and I don't know the outcome of that, but it has been something that has been brought up uh, across the state through the fire network of the fire chiefs. And so um, from a, for a public safety standpoint, not saying that you wouldn't, but what happens when you're no longer here and the fire hydrant is still out there? How do I make that a binding document? And so part of that challenge is from, from a public safety standpoint, um, we felt it was just best to send them to scrap metal and... Uh, and that was kind of the, the recommendation from staff. I'm not arguing with the fire chief. <laughs> and I mean, in terms of the person who put a fire hydrant in the front of their house and painted a curb red, we do have ordinances already on the books that you cannot legally do that yourself. It has to be a city approved red curb. So you, so you can course. report them as a code violation. In their 20 years. So. I think we adopt that. But we have to do public comment now, don't we? Uh, yeah. I'll open public comment on this item. Mr. Bailey. Going along with the discussion of what to do with the fire hydrants. I'd like you to know just last summer, Antique Trader Magazine did a whole scenario on antique manhole covers. One of the most rare and one of the most valuable is from McLeod, California. The fact is that people right now are looking at history and are looking at things like that. I think what Kaiser says, there is a cash value for something like that for an antique value of nothing else. And 
I would just have like to say that uh, there are pictures, like I say, it went national. McLeod, California went national because of one particular man cover. I'm proud to be part of even having that opportunity to read that in a magazine. So I just like to bring that forward. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. I want just no public comment. <laughs> Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Council Menard. I offer Big Dave a consolation prize, and I'm saying good luck to the city of Dunsmuir, <clears throat> the historic bank of Dunsmuir. I own about three tons of radiators that are all <laughs> in the lobby because the radiators are redundant, and we did our best on the scrap metal market to sell them. Nobody wants them. So good luck. <laughs> but if you'd like a ton of radiators. <laughs> Thanks, sir. All right. Uh, I'd like to call the question. Move. Yep. All right. Move, uh, second by the fancy. All those in favor say aye. 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 Against? Motion carries. All right. Uh, and our last item Cal City's discussion and feedback. Let's just put last. Maybe just keep it brief. I'll keep mine very brief. I had the misfortune of coming down with a really nasty cold the first day of the conference. Oh, no. All down there. So, um, my conference, generally speaking, is not as uh, productive as I would normally like, uh, but a number of good insights. And mostly, it was really a joy to get to know Dustin and discuss the city for that concentrated time while attending some events and being inspired. But I'll defer to my more healthy colleagues. Okay. Am I going first? Go ahead. Okay. Um, the first day we had our ethics training, and then later on we went to the general session. Uh, in the general session, we met the former mayor of Los Angeles, who is now the head of the task force, and I can't remember what it was, but just listening to this guy talk is his his enthusiasm, his his drive. It was it was infectious. I, I got to tell you that. And then we got to meet throughout the conference. We got to meet a lot of keynote speakers, and they all had something that I just touched you. Um, I met Jill Ellis. She is a two two time World Cup champion. Um, this is the woman that made equal pay for sports people. The, the, I guess that's where it is. She's, 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 the, she's the, the soccer. She's, she's the coach, coach. For the women's national team. Yeah, she's oh, soccer. Yeah. She's, she's the coach. girl. And it was, it was really neat to listen to her talk. Um, and then the one thing, okay, I'm going to go down here. Uh, I went to the, the one really thing was the session that I really looked for the whole time was the worst fires in California. And I went down there and I listened to them and and, and I have my hand raised because I had a question. And it wasn't really a question, it was a statement. And thank God it worked out perfect. I went last. But I listened to these people from Paradise talk about everything that they changed, the, the, the new building materials in the houses, the roofing, everything that won't burn, the resiliency that this town has. They come up with the, the updated evacuation plan. And I listened to a lot of the things that these guys said. A lot of them make sense. A lot of them need to be clean up on our house and stuff. But then again, we are still, and this was my comment to them, it's like I commended them on everything they've done. I toured that with the League of California cities. Um, I've seen firsthand. I mean, I've seen firsthand. So that's what my big thing is about our evacuation plan. But we are still under that thing. It has to be that time, that day, that moment depending on which way the wind's blowing, if we go north or south. So that's a big, big thing that is still in my mind, but seeing how this town bounced back and everything that they changed to make sure that it don't happen again was, was, was really cool and I learned a lot. Um, there was a guy there that spoke and he talked about civic duties and civic leaders and doing your part. And then he was from the, we're part of the California League of Cities. This guy was the president named Vince Williams of the National League of Cities. And he 
He came out there and he said, if, if anything else <laughs> you take away from this conference, take this. I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty good way to end up the conference. It was. Yeah. Anyway, so that's my report. Good report. Thank you, Councilor Gasson. Um, ethics also, so I got that off my chest there. Um, and that's where that question came up about public comment that I brought back. Um, at the Sacramento Division um, get together, the meeting that we had, um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is it was pointed out that they just had the uh, um, election of officers for the division and all of the uh, officers now for the Sacramento Division are women except for the one male who's the secretary. <laughs> and I thought that was really, uh, perfect in a certain symmetrical kind of way. Um, I also was really impressed by Antonio Villarega. Um, I'd known about him, you know, being tuned into the news and he's obviously not mayor now, but you can just look at the person and, and get a sense of what kind of strength and what kind of dynamism goes into leading a city the size of Los Angeles. So that really struck me. Um, I also was impressed with Jill Ellis, uh, and uh, then moving on to the next day, we had a general session. The thing that struck me the most there was a report on the demographics of, of the California, the changing demographics. And what really struck me was that on one hand, all of the different metrics that move towards what your population is are all going in the wrong direction. Uh, we decreased births, increased deaths, um, and we're having people in particular that are lower in the, income range leaving, lower in the education range leaving. So that's all part of the things that are going on right now. The younger and generation. Younger generation too, yeah. exactly. Um, we had the uh, rural cities um, uh, get together and that's been going on for about four years now. And I know Joan Freeman Smith um, was one of the people that created that. And the whole idea was to try and find a way to uh, help the rural cities. And by rural, it's basically less than 50,000, I think is the number. So it really does include a wide swath of different types of cities. And that's what was apparent there. Uh, what was really um, striking was that everyone felt like all of the laws are being created without taking into mind the rural cities. Um, and, uh, you know, for instance, the whole green waste thing, it makes one sense for a large city with the resources to be able to um, make a change like that and, and accomplish that. Uh, so one of the things that I, I pointed out was one of the things that we could do is to develop a better way uh, for the small cities of um, small rural cities uh, of providing more guidance on what's available and how to get to there. Um, there was also talk about having uh, the rural caucus have a uh, uh, lobbyist um, hired specifically to help the, the smaller cities. Um, so that's kind of where the, the conversation is going right now. And there's, uh, you know, going to take it up with the uh, Cal cities about what we can do. But the larger point is, is that when you have a city staff like Dustin here, you really can't do the same level of research and tap into the same level of money and do the grant writing. So how can we reverse the process instead of making everyone go off and do a treasure hunt? How can we provide a process where it's already laid out for you and all you have to do is follow that path? And then finally, um, I also was really impressed with the, uh, the presentation from, it was from both Santa Rosa with the Tubbs fire and Paradise with the Cal fire or campfire. And uh, they spent about a third of their time talking about the events themselves. And then the rest of it was talking about the whole um, uh, rebuilding process. And uh, so they're bringing their lessons learned. And I, I've talked with uh, Ken Palfini and uh, Sue Tavalero from uh, Weed. And, and I know they're both tuned into the whole process right now of how they tap into the resources to rebuild the areas that have been burned. So that's pretty much what struck me the most in my statement. Mr. Mayor, one, one point note. <coughs> At the California League of Cities, we have three lobbyists that work for us all the time. <coughs> Different people tell them what they're going to be you know, what, this is your project, this is your project. And what we're trying to do is because we can't be the rural caucus. It doesn't work, but we could be a rural coalition and we could have one of these lobbyists working for the rural cities so that we don't have to, we can be exempt from some of the things, the mandates that they're putting on big cities. 
is we can't facilitate some of the things that they're making like Los Angeles do. Yeah, I, money I, I, I have to concur that the rural uh, cities working group was uh, a very positive experience, mostly that it was a group of about 70 cities that all kind of had similar experiences where, hey, this conference is great in some ways, but a large portion of it just doesn't apply to us. Doesn't apply. Right. How do we get more of a voice within this organization? And they, they almost, at least the room, when pulled quickly, seemed to suggest, hey, we could go out and pump, we could lead the league and form our own coalition if we don't find a bigger voice within the league. So it seemed positive, but we'll see. It was really the uh, league nice. Heard us, though. The league heard us. It was nice that when it started off, they, they kind of got down at the beginning and kind of a little circle because I didn't think there'd be many people showing up. And then all of a sudden the place was pretty much full. So there was a lot of interest in the rural cities. That's because at the first meeting, there were eight of us there. <laughs> Only eight of us. So it's got bigger. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll add on to that. So um, you could remember what the, his name or what he did. He was the infrastructure czar for the state. The, go the governor appointed him to oversee a hundred billion dollars of infrastructure improvements within yeah, the state. Right. So I, I'll just kind of add on to that. Um, I kind of did uh, the comments on the, it, the events that we kind of co co attended um, on the general sessions, et cetera. Um, I did attend part of the public service ethics uh, training, but then uh, I kind of wanted to get a feel for everything and, and the, the way it was designed, they kind of, they piled a whole bunch of stuff on top of each other, one right on top on the first day. So I, I, I jumped out of there and went to the city manager's uh, department meeting uh, and spent uh, spent some time there, just kind of get a feel of the room. Um, it's, it's very interesting that there's only about, of all of the cities in the state, there was probably only 70 or 80 participants uh, in that group uh, that are taking roles in, in leadership and, and trying to move forward. Um, city oriented uh, objectives within the department um, from from the city manager's perspective. Um, then I also attended the lunch in uh, Sacramento Valley Division. Um, it was a great little luncheon kind of got to I sat and ate lunch with uh, Todd. So we kind of, you know, got to get that local connection going as well. Um, then uh, on the second day, um, um, I had a number of phone call interruptions, but uh, um, I went to the Going Green by 2025, which is exactly what we talk about with uh, solid waste, and and it's definitely time to let's circle the wagons and and kind of see where you guys are at and and where we can push forward and and what what gaps we need to see. But uh, from what I gathered, it it's it's a monster. I've been dealing with this same kind of thing in in Nebraska, and Minnesota, and Iowa, and it's it's a kind of a nationwide push. But uh, every rural community seems to have the same. Every rural area has the same issues. Um, you know, when I was in Nebraska, we literally shipped our shipped our re recyclables to Denver, which is three hour trip. And then the glass that we shipped to Denver would end up all the way across the country in St. Louis, because that's the only place that took recycled glass in the entire central United States. You know, I mean, Denver's like, what, 5,000, 5 million people, and they couldn't even accomplish to have so, so it's, it's a nationwide issue. Um, so it's just kind of a refresher of what I've seen already and, and hopefully we can figure out a solution. I also uh, uh, attended one of the uh, legal ones. They're a little tough. Um, it's on the essential breakdown for development impact um, fee programs. So how we, how we handle <coughs> development fees and all that stuff. And that was uh, AB 602. And so basically, contact your attorney. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it, it got, it was, it's very interesting, but it's very, very technical on how the calculations have to happen. And so when we start looking at those fees and we want to do anything, we, we got to make sure we, we just follow the rules. And I also uh, kind of went and wanted to do a little bit of refresher on uh, dealing with uh, deferred maintenance and, and, uh, and those kind of things, as we know, uh, we have a lot of deferred maintenance um, you know, facilities, infrastructure, all those kind of things. And so I just kind of went and got a refresher of that. And it was a good, uh, you know, kind of a good, good session, but uh, just ref refresh me on everything I, I thought I knew and, and I still do. So, yeah. Any additional questions? I, I will say that I've gone to a lot of them and they always had the, the uh, the Islanders did the karaoke. 
This year, the Islanders didn't do the karaoke. They had a dessert bar instead. So, um, yeah. All right. I'm going to go to Queen Mary. I swam around the harbor. Okay. On a more serious note, let's move into uh, item 12, future agenda items. And I just want to say uh, for the next meeting, um, I will not be able to attend that meeting. I have a family commitment that day. Um, and our city Steve manager, and I won't either. Oh, okay. And our city manager can't attend, nor finance director. So I was wondering if. Peter and I here just hold the fort down. Yeah, right. and I'll Wendy. So. And We're, Wendy. No yeah, forum. Wendy. All right. Well, if you guys oh, want to do it, we could be here. But uh, it was proposed we move it, uh, special cancel that meeting, do a special meeting on the following Monday, October, or no, the, the prior Monday, October 17th. Oh, time. Whatever time was. I have a, I have a family and or friends in town. Okay. About the I, could, I, could, I could do the Monday after. I the 24th day through Sunday. Do we have I enough items? Monday, to, I can't do Wednesday. Do we have enough items to actually have a meeting? I thought um, was... So I have, I have, I have two items coming, coming up that are, um, they're grants. So they're, they're time dependent. I mean, otherwise, otherwise we were strongly considering canceling that. But uh, one of them, I think we can get by and push to November 3rd. The I other can't. item, uh, let me re-verify that, but I'm, I believe it was, I didn't have the documentation for this meeting. Some okay. I was going to say so. the Wairika Planning Commission meeting, which is usually Wednesday the 19th, got moved to the week after. So I could do the 19th if you want to do a Wednesday. We have Lola. Oh, that's right. And uh, and then yeah, and they got candidate, candidate like forum on the 18th. 18th. Yeah. yeah. November third. You know really what? Good. I can I can try and make seventeen work. I can well, make the seventeen. And here's the thing: if you don't make it, it's a grant. Um, we could certainly read any comments you forward to us. Yeah. And it'll be a quick meeting. Yeah, I'll I'll make the seventeen. Is that a Monday? That's yeah. Monday. I don't know if I can be here, but I'll try. Okay. We're, we're a better time. Five. Monday and Wednesdays. I got lawyers. I got lawyers. Well, I could do it during the day since I'm not working that day. Yeah, I can. I could do it during the day if that works for everyone else. Earlier? Well, I have staff. I have something at noon I can't do on that day, but I can do it another time. Peter uh, says as long as it's afternoon. All right, let's do uh, 3, 3 p.m. 3 p.m. on yeah. the 17th? Yep. Okay. Okay. And then uh, I don't know what time it is. Instead of the 20th, we're going to do 3 p.m. on the 17th. Um, and then the agenda meeting for that meeting, although it'll be a very quick one, uh, will be Council of Dutch. So, okay. Thursday. Thursday at three. Thursday. Wait, at no. Three. Thursday, we won't be here. No. The previous week. You're talking about next Thursday. Yeah. We won't oh, yeah, be, we'll be We will not be here. Okay. We'll be we back do, Sunday. We can do it over the phone or I can move to the next person um, and come back. That sounds good. Unless Juliana can. I, I can do it I over. Do a well, I can call into a Thursday at three. Maybe okay. Yeah. Should be a lighter agenda. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Motion to adjourn. Second. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Against. So adjourned. Mr. Thank Bailey, you. I appreciate your your fortitude. Hey. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pleasure. Well, sir. Yeah. I would oh, normally catch it. If you want. <laughs> Not that anyone's quote that matters. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, because actually, what I, a lot of, well, here's what he reached back to me. Bert, the Notre Dame guy, reached back to me and said that.